For most people in the land of 10,000 lakes, heading up north means taking a trip to their weekend cabin. Few are lucky enough to call the North Woods home year round. But the Minnesota father who built this cabin with his own two hands is one of them. This is you and Drew. What year is this, do you know? Uh, 2000. Maybe. Just getting ready to go to college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Alan Shadeen has called his daughter Drew, Drewzy, ever since she was little. She vanished just before Thanksgiving in 2003. That's one of her early works, right? Yes, that one's real early. I think she was seven or eight years old when she drew that. Amazing. It's basically Amazing. the view right outside the window. Yep. As a college student, Drew was majoring in graphic design, but it's clear she had been an artist long before that. Before she disappeared, Drew was a senior at the University of North Dakota and so excited to graduate. But the Gamma Phi Beta sorority sister would never get the chance. The last time I saw her was right downtown Park Rapids watching a Vikings game. That's a good memory. Yeah. Yeah. And as I drove away, I had this really eerie feeling. Do you remember the last thing you said to her? Oh, be careful, I love you. One month later, and a few hours away in Grand Forks, North Dakota, is when and where Alan Shadeen's 20-year nightmare would begin. So the Columbia Mall is in the south end of Grand Forks. It's just a uh, shadow of what it was back in 2003. Several of the businesses in, inside have closed, and Victoria's Secret, where Drew was working, that closed several years ago. In 2003, during the uh, Drew Shadeen investigation, I was assigned uh, to assist. At the time, my partner was Ori Seneschal. Grand Forks was approximately 50,000 people at the time. It's right along the Red River, on the west side of the Red River, putting it into North Dakota. The University of North Dakota was a big part of that town. Just across the Red River is Minnesota and the city of East Grand Forks. But for people living on both sides, it feels like one big community. People were nice and everybody, I think, felt comfortable there. And there wasn't a lot of crime. It's a place where people might think bad things don't happen here. But what happened to Drew Shadeen? changed everything. On November 22nd, 2003, Drew was working at Victoria's Secret in Columbia Mall. I believe she was scheduled to get off work at 4 p.m. After work, she went to Marshall Fields, which was also in the mall, so she could purchase a purse. They found video at Marshall Fields. In the video, you can see Drew entering the store, exiting the store. Drew was wearing black pants, a black pea coat, and she had a pink uh, shirt on underneath the coat. She was a 22-year-old UND uh, college student. She was from Pequot Lakes, Minnesota. She was described as one of those people that everybody liked, bubbly personality, outgoing, very kind, very giving. The purse she bought at Marshall Fields that afternoon was a gift for her mom. It would have been dark or getting to be dark at five o'clock. It was, you know, November 22nd, so approaching the, the winter months. She made a phone call to her boyfriend, Christopher Lang, and she was speaking with Christopher as she was walking to her car. Drew had been talking on the phone uh, from roughly 5 p.m. to 5.04 p.m. to her boyfriend, and that phone call was interrupted, and she abruptly hung up. Prior to doing so, she said uh, something along the lines of, OK, OK. We've all been leaving work, talking on the phone, multitasking, doing this, doing that, and then all of a sudden, in, in the blink of an eye, you're in that situation, and you know things have changed forever. I'm a journalist from Minnesota, and this was one of the first big cases I covered a few years out of college. Being close to Drew in age, it really impacted me. 
I think Drew's case touched people on a national level because she seemed just like everybody's daughter, everybody's friend, somebody that everybody could identify with. And it was tragic when she disappeared. Chris initially thinks Drew's gonna call back. When six o'clock rolls around and he hasn't heard from her, he gets worried. He starts calling her and leaving messages. He also calls her roommate and learns she hasn't been back to their apartment. Later in the evening, Drew's boyfriend, Chris, did receive a uh, phone call from Drew's phone. But at that time, there was no communication. All Chris was able to hear at that point was um, what sounded like the buttons being pushed. And that was um, approximately 7.42 PM. Drew's boyfriend calls Drew's roommate, Meg Murphy, again and suggests she try calling the bar where Drew was supposed to work a shift later that night. She was employed at El Rocco Bar. She was supposed to work, I believe, at 9 p.m. that night, and she did not show up for work. They didn't think she would have not shown up for work without calling somebody or letting somebody know. Please come in. Hi, um, I'm calling one of our, actually my roommate, um, was supposed to be home like a couple hours ago. How old is she? 22. November 22nd, 2003, I'd heard them dispatch one of our other officers to talk to a roommate of a gal that hadn't shown up. I said, well, I'll drive down to the mall and see if I can spot her car. We're in the northeast parking lot of the mall outside the Penny's building, and Drew's car was parked in this space. Red Olds Cutlass was parked in this parking spot. By 11 o'clock when I got here, the lot was pretty much empty. and There wasn't anybody around, so it was easy to find. I went and looked in the car. It looked like a bomb had gone off in the back seat, but then a lot of kids had cars like that. So I did find the bag with the, with the purse that she bought at Marshall Fields. I locked it up. By the driver's side rear wheel was a black object. So it looked out of place. The knife sheath was laying by the left rear tire on the driver's side. I picked it up, put it in my pocket. I had no idea how important that piece of evidence was going to turn out to be. As the search for Drew continues, police soon ask Drew's boyfriend, Chris, more questions, including why he didn't call police right away. It wasn't a scream. It wasn't uh, it, it wasn't anything that would, it was, it was just a, it, it cut off. He was in a relationship with her. We needed to verify his alibi. Oftentimes, the people close to the victim are responsible for their disappearance. 